We are gathered to worship our God. Send your spirit upon us. We come from many places with many burdens. Send your spirit upon us. We turn our hearts to you, O God. Send your spirit upon us. And, and make, make us your, your beloved, beloved family. Good morning, church. Today is Trinity Sunday. In our church, we believe that no matter who you are or where you are on life's journey, that you are welcome here. Hear now these words from this opening prayer. Spirit of life and love, we gather together in different ways this morning, from computer screens to telephones and even car radios, we gather. Reaching out across the wires, waving from a safe distance, we come together in community. From living room to front porch to car seat, we gather as we are able, ready to be of service to each other and to the world, ready to build the community of hope and love as we face this day. We are apart, but we are together, offering our love, our commitment, our hope, and our prayers in service to one another and to our world. Amen. an angel of the Lord said to Philip, Get up and go towards the south to the road that goes from Jerusalem to Gaza. This was a wilderness road. So he got up and went. Now there was an Ethiopian eunuch, a court official of the Canaan's queen of the Ethiopians, in charge of her entire treasury. He had come to Jerusalem to worship and was returning home. Seated in his chariot, he was reading the prophet Isaiah. Then the spirit said to Philip, Go over to this chariot and join it. So Philip ran up to it and heard him reading the prophet Isaiah. He asked, Do you understand what you're reading? He replied, How can I, unless someone guides me? And he invited Philip to get in and sit beside him. In the reading of these words, may we hear the word of the Lord. Amen. The story in today's scripture reminds us that everything, even our faith, is ever-changing and evolving. On the day of Pentecost, Philip, a follower of Christ, was filled with the Spirit and left Jerusalem for parts unknown to share the love of God and the story of Jesus. One day, Philip receives word from an angel that God wants him to go south on the desert road from Jerusalem to Gaza. Philip does as he was told, no questions asked. It's hard to second-guess an angel bearing a personal message from the Lord God Almighty. On the road, Philip met a man who seemed altogether different from him. This man was African, from Ethiopia, while Philip was a Middle Easterner of Semitic descent. In addition to their geographical differences, they also had cultural differences. This man was a eunuch, meaning he was a castrated servant whose sexuality had been stolen by those in power. But that's another sermon for another day. The Ethiopian eunuch in today's story was obviously very smart and very loyal to land such an important job with the queen. According to the law of Moses, eunuchs were excluded from the temple. While the eunuch in this story is called a God-fearer, or convert to Judaism, he was nevertheless culturally removed from those born into Judaism. Economically, 
Philip and the man from Ethiopia, were on different ends of the spectrum. The eunuch was a court official, the treasurer for the queen of Ethiopia. As the queen's treasurer, he represented those with great power. After all, the eunuch didn't walk along the dusty desert road like Philip. Instead, he rode in a late model chariot with a chauffeur. The eunuch was well connected with the rich and powerful, while Philip was of humble means. Along the road, Philip overheard the eunuch reading aloud from the prophet Isaiah and asked if he understood the text. The eunuch replied, how can I, unless someone guides me? He then invited Philip to sit beside him in the chariot. The eunuch was reading a suffering servant passage in the book of Isaiah. These passages profoundly shaped Christ's ministry and the church's understanding of Christ's mission. Although the eunuch visited Jerusalem and read the Hebrew scriptures, he had never heard the stories of Jesus until Philip showed up. Before long, they saw a body of water, and the eunuch asked, What is to prevent me from being baptized? In other words, why should I be excluded from the fellowship of those baptized followers of Jesus. The way he phrases the question is telling. He doesn't say straight out, I want to be baptized. Instead, he assumes that there might be a problem if he wants to be baptized. Listen to the subtext. What is to prevent me from being baptized? I know of no other question in the New Testament like this. In essence, he says, tell me why I cannot be baptized, because he fully expected barriers to his baptism. His negative expectations might have arisen out of religious concerns, and who can blame him? He had been excluded from the temple. Besides the eunuch, really was a Jewish in two ways. One, he did believe in Israel's God, and yet he was not culturally Jewish because he was not born into a Jewish family. Another issue might very well have been his sexual identity or lack thereof. Another issue might have been racial. As a Middle Easterner, Philip probably had brown skin. As an Ethiopian, the eunuch skin was probably much darker than Philip's. Perhaps the Ethiopian feared being racially profiled and deliberately excluded from the followers of Jesus. Whatever the reason, religion, sexuality, or race, the eunuch assumed there would be roadblocks on his journey to baptism. Thus he asks, what is to prevent me from being baptized? The simple and beautiful answer was this. He shouldn't be excluded, and he should be baptized if he desired it, and he did. So the driver stopped the chariot, and Philip baptized the eunuch right then and there in a pool of water by the side of the road. Traditional biblical interpretation focuses on the conversion aspect of this story. However, the story is also one of radical inclusion. Many people are excluded in our world because of skin color, social standing, religious perspectives, and sexual identity. These issues still divide us. We have to fix this division. Ahmed Arbery just wanted to go for a jog. Brianna Taylor just wanted a quiet night at home after working as an EMT. And George Floyd, he just wanted to breathe. Why were Brianna, 
Ahmad and George denied their right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. These deaths and countless others cry out to our one nation under God, proving over and over and over that we are a nation with liberty and justice for some, but not for all. I remember when I got my driver's license on my 16th birthday, my parents reminded me to practice defensive driving and never speed. But never were they forced to have what black families refer to as the talk when they explain appropriate behavior if, and often when, their children get pulled over by law enforcement. I was talking to Art Dansbury recently, and he told me about the first time he was pulled over for driving while black. It was in the 1950s when Art and a friend got pulled over by the police for no reason. Art asked the officer what he had done. The officer told him it was for, quote, general questioning. The officer then, without probable cause, searched the car top to bottom. When he found nothing, the officer let Art and his friend go. It could easily have ended differently. As you might guess, it was not the last time Art and later his son Tad were pulled over again for no reason. Seventy years later, here we are. Racism is a burden and a threat that people of color deal with their entire lives. I'm not saying we should be anti-police. Far from it. That's a disservice to the good cops who put their lives on the line to protect us every day. Of course, like any group of people, there are some bad apples. The same is true of the protesters. Just as there are some bad apples in law enforcement, there are some bad apples at a protest march. 99% of those marching are nonviolent, law-abiding citizens exercising their First Amendment rights, which never gets the news coverage that looters and brick throwers get. As I seek to understand how we got to this place as a country, I am forced to reckon with that white guy in the mirror whose skin color has been an advantage since day one. I'm trying to use this moment to listen and learn from people who never had the advantage of white skin. Colleen and I just watched a television series called Little Fires Everywhere. Issues of race are front and center throughout the series. Reese Witherspoon plays Elena, a wealthy white woman who believes that she treats everyone the same. Kerry Washington plays Mia, an African-American artist who sees through Elena's facade. The underlying tension boils over when Elena lectures Mia, saying, A good mother makes good choices. Mia responds, You didn't make good choices. You had good choices. Options that being rich and white and entitled gave you. This made me think, my life has been full of advantages I never even thought of as advantages. I had good choices by virtue of my skin, my parents, my middle class upbringing. The question is how will I and how will we as a church proceed? How will I use my advantages to be an ally to people of color. There are so many ways to be an ally. Pick one and go from there. We can join a peaceful march like some of our members did earlier this afternoon. Support black businesses. 
educate ourselves by reading books, consider candidates' positions on race relations before we vote, read racially inclusive books to our children and grandchildren, and call out racist remarks instead of letting them slide. My hope is that we will all think about how we can become more actively anti-racist. This is not an accusation. It's a hope that we won't be content to be bystanders, that we'll be part of the solution. The love found in the Gospels is one of radical inclusion. How will we bring that love to life? Amen.